Lord, we thank you for your word. We believe it is all those wonderful things that we were thinking of earlier. Uh, Lord, we believe that your word is understandable. We know that from even our reading of it today. We know that this word that you have breathed out is useful, that it is powerful, that it affects the ends that you have for it. We pray now that you would help us to understand from your word the purpose of your word, so that as we are messengers of yours, those who are called to take your word, we won't mishandle it or mishandle those who hear. Help us now to that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There was a calendar date, a moment, says one of the characters in Tom Stoppard's play, Jumper. There was a calendar date, a moment, when the onus of proof passed from the atheist to the believer. When, quite suddenly, the nose had it. You know what he means. Many people today don't believe in God, in Christ, in the Bible, in churches, or even in Christianity in the way they used to. Many different reasons are given. I'm sure you hear these as well as I do. How many times have I been told, I just don't like organized religion? Or I'm spiritual, but just not very religious. Oh, it's Jesus I like, it's the church that I have a problem with. Some would say that it's because the gospel wasn't presented to them in the right way. Some would say they don't believe in Christianity because it hasn't been useful enough. Others just because they don't like it. Still others chide Christians for being escapists. Some libertarians associated with bleeding heart liberal giveaway programs. On the other hand, some political liberals associated with the extreme right wing. You can come up with, with whatever political excuse you want for not believing Christianity is true. Some people simply think that there isn't a God. Other people don't believe because they weren't brought up to. Some people don't believe because they know some people who do. They don't like them. And they don't want to become like them. Others find it hard to believe the Bible or in any reality of the supernatural. Some are too busy dealing with this real life to worry about religion and all that made-up stuff. Others think that Christians are too pessimistic or too narrow-minded or too traditional or too gullible. Aldous Huxley said that he and his friends didn't believe in Christianity because it was too morally restricting. The actor Hugh Grant said he didn't believe in truth at all. He believes in style. I used to be an unbeliever, an agnostic. I simply thought that there wasn't enough evidence for the truth of Christianity. That is, until I looked more at the evidence. Why don't people believe? That's a question that haunts many unbelievers and believers alike. That's a question that preachers like us need to understand. Is the only reason people aren't believing because we didn't preach like Mike told us to this morning? Do we assume that if we understand the point of the text, both the content and the intent, and we're able to reproduce that in our sermons, that then people will believe? Open your Bibles to the Gospel of John. That's the very question that interested Jesus and John in John chapter 12. 
beginning at verse 37. John 12, beginning at verse 37. even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. For this reason, they could not believe because as Isaiah says elsewhere he has blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him Yet at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved praise from men more then praise from God. Then Jesus cried out, when a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. As for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world but to save it. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day, for I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. I know that his command leads to eternal life, so whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Friends, I want us to look in this time primarily at unbelievers, but then also at believers, and finally at a couple of seeming hybrids between the two. And I hope this may help us understand more about belief and unbelief in ourselves, even as preachers, and in those we preach to. What's going on? in those who physically hear the Word of God from our lips. First, and I want us to spend most of our time, as I think this passage does, considering unbelievers. Look again there at verse 37. Even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in Him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. For this reason they could not believe, because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. Then skip down to verse 47. As for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge them, for I did not come to judge the world but to save it. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words, that very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. For I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. Friends, look at that verse 37. Even after Jesus had done all these great works, miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. Now, exegetically, if you're familiar with the Gospel of John, you'll know that's where the book splits in two. That's the conclusion of the first half of John's Gospel. The first half has often been called the book of signs. It's these signs, these mega, these great ergo, these great works 
that he's doing. And he's doing them as signs because they are significant. Significant. They are actions that point to something more than merely the actions themselves. So Jesus doesn't heal all sick people, give all blind people their sight, feed all hungry people. He doesn't. It is true he very occasionally does these things. But when he does them, he does them as signs so that they will see the even more important matter of who he is, of what he has come to do. The first half of the book is all about this. And the extraordinary thing for us to realize is that even after Jesus did all these signs, they still did not believe in him. And the rest of the book will turn now to the last week of his life. We'll have his teaching, his suffering, his passion on the cross, and then his resurrection and ascension. One of the clear themes in the first half of John's gospel has been really enunciated from the very beginning. You look back in chapter 1, verse 11. His own receives him not. Now that was the grim and confusing reality in which the first century Christians labored. The first ones who would have read John's gospel were laboring in the reality that they were among many people who did not believe in Jesus. Even Jews, whose Messiah Jesus most especially was, who rejected him as that. It's the situation in which many faithful preachers today labor. We work, we study, we cultivate our own hearts, we try to preach as honestly and ably as we may, and yet still people do not believe. Many of the very people who had been prepared for the Messiah rejected him. Why? Why? Well, John follows Jesus in turning to the Scriptures for the answer. He goes to the Old Testament. Here in John chapter 12, verse 38, John quotes Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53. Now, if we were to turn back to Isaiah chapter 53, which I think we should, let's turn to Isaiah 53. I don't turn a lot like this in normal sermons when I'm preaching on a Sunday morning at church. But I think for a room full of preachers, there's no reason we shouldn't do this. Just take a moment, go back to Isaiah chapter 53. Let's see why this is. Isaiah chapter 53, what some people call the first gospel. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Friends, the people's rejection of Jesus was part of the substitutionary suffering of the Messiah. If you sometimes thought that the only substitutionary suffering Jesus, Jesus took on for sinners like you and me were the nails through his hands or his experience on the cross, I think you've mistaken the summit for the whole mountain. 
There is a mountain of suffering in the incarnation. Uh, the humiliation begins early and ends horribly. Part of that suffering is this rejection that's prophesied as God's people reject the Messiah, as they reject God Himself. You'll notice now back in John chapter 12 that this unbelief was a comprehensive unbelief combining both the words and the deeds. Or if you look in verse 38, uh, the message and the arm, what God says and what God does. Both eyes and hearts. Verse 40, sight and understanding. I think I can say from years of personal experience with my own heart and reading and talking with others about this, belief never involves the mind alone. Belief never involves the mind alone. It is comprehensive. Down in verse 48, we come to the core of the unbelief. Look there at verse 48. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. So interesting, here not accepting Jesus' words is associated with rejecting him. Now if you know your Bible, that should sound familiar, a relationship being wrecked by words being rejected. What does that make you think of, preacher? Well, the garden, exactly, Genesis 3, the Garden of Eden. That's, that's exactly what goes on. God's Word is there. God's Word is rejected. And in rejecting that Word, we reject Him. The relationship is broken. As surely as your relationship with your wife is broken when you just stop listening to her. So the word in our passage in John's Gospel continues to be central. It's central to understanding Jesus' own relationship with the Father, how Jesus is close to the Father. We see in verses 44 and 45. We see there in verses 49 and 50, the Father gave Jesus His words. And therefore, verse 48, the Father will judge rejection of these words. Well, in a quite similar way, the Word is also central to our relationship with Jesus. Here in our passage, not believing is clearly not accepting Jesus' words. So acceptance or rejection of Jesus' words is equated with acceptance or rejection of Jesus' person. Please think about that carefully. This must be clear. To reject Jesus' words, that rejection is equated with rejecting Jesus. Now, this has very serious implications for anyone who would try to pursue a Jesus apart from Jesus' own teaching in the Gospels. Friends, you could in ignorance or stupidity try to do that. You could do it in academic hubris, like the Jesus Seminar did several years ago, you know, when they color-coded the words of Jesus with many different colors in order to express their level of certainty in which ones were truly the words of Christ. You could do it in a kind of mystical, ignorant devotion to the Spirit of Christ, where you imagine that my Jesus would never. Well, what reason do we have to think that your Jesus is real? How do we know who Jesus is and what Jesus is like? Well, more than any other way, by what Jesus has said, by who He Himself has claimed to be, by what He's taught us about Himself. Again, in verse 48, as with Jesus there, 
So with the Father, there is clearly a close association between his word and his person. So since Jesus has the Father's words to reject Jesus, he's not only to reject him, but it's to reject the Father himself. And that's why Jesus can say here that it is not him, it is not Jesus who's judging the unbeliever. Rather, Jesus' words given him by the Father will condemn the unbeliever at the last day. Very much like that prophet that Moses prophesied about would come back in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Remember this prophet Moses foretold? The Lord said through Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. Everything? If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about in John's gospel. Friends, much fruitful meditation we could do here. We we understand how unbelief is described here a little bit better, but on to this hard question. Why? Why would they not believe? Well, a most bizarre answer is given in verse 40. So they would not turn and be healed. That's why. At so there, verse 40. Those of you who are looking at your Greek New Testaments realize that's a henna. That's a purpose clause. It expresses that purpose. The purpose was that they not see or understand or turn. It would seem that God's purpose was that they not turn themselves and so be healed. I, I say God's purpose Because if you look at verses 38 to 40, it seems that they do not believe in order to fulfill Scripture. To fulfill prophecy? Yes. I mean, again, notice verse 39's could not. Well, you say, what about up in verse 37, the the would not? Well, that's really a, a simple, you know, were not or did not. Many of the early church fathers tried to soften this verse 39 to a a would not. But that's not what the word means, friends. Again, if you've got your Greek news, it's adunito. It's not able. Dunito, able, capable, powerful. Ah, no, not, without. This is not able, not able. It's the same word that's used when Jesus says with man, this is impossible. Or when we're told in Luke 1 that nothing is impossible with God. Or when Jesus says, what is impossible with men is possible with God. Or, or when the, the man who couldn't walk in, in Acts 14 is described by Luke as adunato in his feet. He is crippled. His feet are unable to walk. Or what Paul says in Romans 8, the law was powerless to do. Or Romans 15, where he speaks of the failings of the weak. Hebrews 6, 4, it is impossible for those who've once been enlightened. Or 6, 18, it is impossible for God to lie. He is not able to do. He cannot do it. Or Hebrews eleven six. 6, without faith, it is adunito. It is not possible to please God without faith. It is literally something that one is unable to do. It is powerless. It is impossible. Now, let's step back and recall what's going on here. Jesus has come, and all of these signs and wonders have been done. These prophecies have been fulfilled, and I've been preaching through John's gospel back in D.C. for the last few months, and I have never in preaching the gospels been struck so much by how many prophecies were fulfilled. And I have, I have never noticed as much how popular Jesus was. Uh, there are Jews all over the place in first century Palestine, and I think especially in Jerusalem, perceiving Jesus to be fulfilling the prophecies about the Messiah. There are all kinds of people who are perceiving that Jesus is the Messiah. In one sense, this thing is about to explode, it looks like. And still, so many of them didn't believe. With all of those extraordinary, remarkable, you would say impossible, coincidental fulfillments of these prophecies. Verse 37, and still they would not believe. 
But you think, well, maybe this is only during the ministry of Jesus. Uh, Mark, this is an interesting study of God's Word here about the Gospels. But for my ministry as a preacher, I am not the unique Son of God. I am not the Messiah. I do not undergo the substitutionary sufferings of Christ prophesied in Isaiah. So this is interesting for me to know, important to understand the cross, but has no immediate bearing on my experience as a preacher of God's Word today. If you go to Deuteronomy 29, you don't need to turn there, but if you were to turn there, at the end of Moses' life, Moses summoned all the Israelites, uh, these people that had seen so many great acts of God, who had heard his words. And what did Moses say to the people who had seen the deliverance through the wilderness, who had seen food and water supernaturally provided? What did Moses say to this people? who saw these signs and wonders from God. He said to them, Your eyes have seen all the Lord did in Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to all his land. With your own eyes you saw those great trials, those miraculous signs and great wonders. But to this day the Lord has not given you a mind that understands or eyes that see or ears that hear. Deuteronomy 29, verses 2 to 4. Back to John 12. Verse 38. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, verse 39, they could not believe because as Isaiah says elsewhere, verse 40, he, referring to God, he has blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn. He, God, has done this. Mark, how do you put this together theologically? Well, I assume God did this merely by not giving them grace. God left them in their blindness. The theological word is preterition. God passed them by. At least that is going on here. Certainly there was a self-hardening. There's no question about that. That's one of the effects of evil. They're clearly culpable for their unbelief. Thus in verse 37 he says, they still would not believe in him, though there were all these reasons to believe in him. And there were even reasons given for the unbelief of some. You look up in verse 43. They loved praise from men more than praise from God. But God is also said to do this condemning to hardened unbelief as a just and holy judgment of guilty people who have chosen to be what they are. This was what's called a judicial hardening. Paul says in Romans 9, 18, that God hardens whom he wants to harden. Or as he said to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 2, they perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned to have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Now Isaiah 6 that Jesus quotes from refers to a temporary hardening. It's quoted again by Jesus, you remember, in the synoptics to explain the parable of the sower. And by Paul at the end of Acts, in Acts 28, explaining why God turns from the Jews to the Gentiles. Very similar to what Paul writes to the Romans in Romans 11:25. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Friends, I want you to be very careful with these truths. God's activity is never pitted against human responsibility. You will never get anywhere in serving the Lord if you try to help people think that they are not responsible for their actions. They are responsible for your actions. You don't have to understand theologically and logically how it all works, but you must know we are responsible for our actions. And you must make sure the people you preach to know that. But God's sovereignty is something we also know. And if you jettison God's sovereignty because of hard passages like this, you jettison the only ground you have for any hope. Because my friend, when you go evangelizing in the cemetery, there's not one dead person you can raise. 
But God can raise a room full like this Amen. of people who were spiritually dead, whom He, by His grace and mercy, has brought to life by His Word. We need that kind of confidence in the sovereignty of God when we would preach His Word. Indeed, our only hope is that God is sovereign. This is part of a, a larger plan of God for redemption, for Him to be glorified. Much we could say about that, but for our purposes here, do notice the hardening effect of the Word. For all we say in the last session about the Word's usefulness and effectiveness and fruitfulness, all of which is true, one thing the Bible tells us that it does is to harden. I don't know about you, but I from time to time will warn people who come to church in my preaching that they are in danger of falling under a delusion. It's a delusion that was well illustrated by Mike's story about the Mona Lisa and the guard saying, you know, it's not the Mona Lisa that's, in, that's being judged, it's the viewer who's being judged. We need to tell people that. Coming to church is dangerous. Exposing yourself to God's Word, you may think it's a passive matter where you sit and are the Olympic judges of the diving homiletic contest before you, where you coolly post, oh, that was an 8.9, that was a 9.2. That's delusion. Every time the Word comes to you and me, when we read it in our rooms in the morning, when we recall it to our minds, when we hear it preached on the Lord's day from the Lord's man, that word is evaluating us. And if we do not respond in softness and suppleness to it, God's word will harden us. It has a hardening effect on those who hear and train themselves to ignore it. Warn your people. And note Isaiah's willingness to serve even here. I am blown away as I see the Lord telling Isaiah, your ministry is going to be unfruitful. And Isaiah serves. Or I think of Jeremiah. Or Ezekiel, that amazing call God gives him in chapter 1. But have you ever gone on and read Ezekiel 2 and 3? He's calling him to a people that are less responsive than your church or mine. These people, their, their hearts are hardened and stubborn against the Word, and yet still God calls him to preach His Word. Somehow, God is glorified in the Word going out, even when the response is hard and cold. Still, there is a steely, adamantine, certain, unerring glory that goes to God as the resistance of the sinner's heart to His Word shows to highlight the righteousness of God's Word and ultimately even the power of God's Word. It's the experience we know even more comprehensively, just more than just in preaching, in our Christian lives. You go to 1 Peter 1 and 2, we understand that we live in a world that rejects Christ. If we are following Christ, we will know rejection. That's part of what it means. What happened to Jesus Christ? He was rejected. If we follow Him, what will happen to us? We'll build a megachurch. <laughs> the community will think well of us and will really miss us if we're gone. Well, maybe. Uh, our church has grown. I'm not sad about that. I'm happy about that. We've seen a lot of people saved. Praise God. And honestly, I think our neighborhood would miss us if we were gone. They might think parking's a little easier on Sunday, but I think otherwise I think they would miss us. But I don't assume that's the normal or the always experience of the Christian in this world. I know there are many of our brothers and sisters right now who are not 
loved by their community. Their churches are not prospering in any evident, apparent way of growth numerically. And because of who we follow and because of how he was responded to, I'm not surprised by that. I'm not confused by that. I'm not sent thinking, maybe, maybe I need to find something other than expositional preaching to do, because this clearly isn't working. Really? What is working? Help me understand what working is biblically. These are the unbelievers in John's gospel. But it's clear that this general hardening of people didn't preclude individual salvation. There were certainly those who were real believers. Look again at verse 44. Actually, go up to verse 41. Isaiah, let's not leave out Isaiah. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. And then down to 44. Then Jesus cried out, when a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. For I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Now I want you to notice two things about this real belief. This real belief is centered in Jesus. This real belief is centered in Jesus. This is true even for Isaiah. Isaiah believed in Jesus. Verse 41, Isaiah saw the glory of God in the rejected Messiah, and he spoke about him in Isaiah 53. Now, to people in his own time, Jesus revealed his glory. You remember that? When he, when he first goes to the temple back in John chapter 2, he reveals his glory there in the temple. And his disciples put their faith in him. And then here in John chapter 12, verses 44 to 50 is really a good summary of Jesus' teaching. If you want to take one little bit from John's gospel, something other than John 3, 16 to 19, which is a great summary also, but if you want another one like it, here's one in John 11, or John 12, rather, 44 to 50. So it's no surprise that in this passage, Jesus' identity with God is very clear because you look there in verse 44, believing in Jesus means believing in God. Verse 45, seeing Jesus is seeing God. Verses 49 and 50, hearing Jesus is hearing God. Now, the, the comprehensiveness of the belief, just like the, the comprehensiveness of unbelief that we had seen earlier. Verses 45 and 46, the eyes, verses 47 to 50, the ears. So in hearing Jesus, one realizes that one is hearing God himself. Real belief centers in Jesus. Second, real belief brings benefits. Because believing in Jesus, friends, it's moving from night to day. It's moving from darkness to light, verse 46. It's helping us to move from fantasy to reality. And believing in Jesus leads ultimately to eternal life. Look at verse 50. I know that his command leads to eternal life. We begin to live as we were meant to live, as we were made in order to live. Real believing, you know, is not mere mental assent. That's not the full import of what Jesus means here by believe. Martin Luther said, acquired faith, by that he means mere intellectual faith, mental assent, stands like a lazy man, concealing his hand under his armpits, and says, mm, that's nothing to me. True faith, with arms outstretched, joyfully embraces the Son of God given for it, and says, He is my beloved, and I am His. And that's what the nature of true, saving faith in Christ is and does. Real belief in Jesus means a restored relationship with God. 
taking his words in and believing them, speaking words of faith back to him and trust. That is the nature of a relationship. We today, I think, would tend to disassociate the word from the experience of personal relationship. We tend to think of the word as something mental, something academic, something that we associate with the study. Whereas personal relationship is the telephone, it's the visit, it's the pastoral call. As preachers, we must be ever alert to that false and destructive dichotomy. That dichotomy is aimed at the very heart of Christianity. Don't misunderstand that. You need to understand, and you need your people to understand, that they are in la-la land. They are just imagining things if they think they know the true God apart from the Word of God. The Spirit of God takes God's Word and reveals the truth about Himself and about us. And apart from that word, we are in darkness. Friends, we need to not only champion thin, fragile, frail, brittle statements of faith, and I love statements of faith, but we need to pour experiential water on them and let them become whole and three-dimensional and real. And we need to help our people understand just what we were thinking about from Deuteronomy 8 that God lets us hunger so that He feeds us by His Word, so that we know we are dependent creatures, and that we're dependent on Him and His Word, and we're joyfully dependent. We don't want to be independent of Him. I love the example of William Hunter. I wonder if you've ever heard of him. In the country of England, in the county of Essex, which is just to the northeast of London, in the town of Brentwood, lived a 19-year-old named William Hunter. And I call him a 19-year-old because he never got any older, because he was burned alive at the stake, because he wanted to read his Bible in English. Now, you may not think it's very important somebody in your youth group wants to read their Bible very much. You may think that's one of 15 good spiritual disciplines that, you know, it wouldn't be bad if you cultivated this too, but he's pretty good at prayer and he's really good at guitar. William Hunter was burned alive because he wouldn't stop when he was warned in 1555. He was warned against continuing to read his Bible in English. He wouldn't stop because that was worth more to him than life itself. People pled with him. He refused to recant. And so he was burned to death. He seems to have been a real believer in Jesus and in his word. Friends, I just give examples from 1555 because I did my PhD in Puritan studies. But I read enough and know enough to realize there are examples of that around the world today if I only knew about them. We've got brothers and sisters in Iran, in China, in North Korea, in India, right now in Tanzania, in Nigeria who are giving their lives because of the importance of the Word of God, holding to it firmly. If the people in our congregations on Sunday morning heard that, would they be surprised? Would they think it's strange? Would they think it odd? Would it make no sense with the kind of Christianity we've presented? Is the Word of God not that valuable to us? Have we presented it as less central, less valuable? John's gospel is full of sharp dichotomies. That's been clear to me preaching through it this time. We see that even in this passage, revealed, not revealed, seeing blind, understanding hearts, dead hearts, loving God's praise most, loving man's praise most, light, darkness, saved, judged, accepting Jesus' words, rejecting Jesus, eternal life condemned. And then the one we've been thinking about, of course, believe, not believe. 
But there are two other types of believers in our passage, which seem uncharacteristically of this book to be hybrids. And as preachers, I think we want to be aware of this. These are sort of hybrids of believers and unbelievers, and hybrids, I think, can be as dangerous as they are confusing. There are these secret believers. Did you notice them? Verse 42. Yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. Many even among the leaders believed in him. Many even among the leaders believed in him. Now, I don't know about you, but in D.C. on Capitol Hill, this would be evangelistic success. This is what we're going for. If we reach the important people, all the little people will follow. Yeah, find a revival that's ever really happened in the history of the church like that. I'm not denying that it's ever happened, but it maybe has never happened. It certainly almost never happened. <laughs> Rich people always like to think that's how it happens. I don't think it's happened very much like that in church history. At the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. I wonder what kind of belief it is. It's the same word in the Greek, but I wonder what kind of belief this is. How about the next sentence? But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear. They would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved praise from men more than praise from God. I don't need to paint the situation much more. The Holy Spirit has done it so wonderfully for us here. We all too easily relate to that, loving the praise of man more than the praise of God. Are there scenes in your own personal history that flash to mind when you've loved the praise of man, maybe even a good man, more than the praise of God? We don't look down at these people. We look across at them. We understand. We understand all too well. Verse 43, or, or, or could be read, they loved the glory of men more than the glory of God. That was the arena of their chief concern. So when they were confronted with the glory of God, as Isaiah had been in his vision in the temple, they, unlike Isaiah, were taken up by unbelief, desiring the acceptance of the world around rather than being taken up with the glory of God. Like Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6, and like they had seen in Jesus, as we read back in John 1 and John 2, when confronted with the glory of God, these people he's describing here made a different choice than Isaiah had made. These will think, but they won't speak up because of what other people might think. But Jesus will have no secret followers, finally. There are also these kind of, what do we call them, down in verse 47 and 48, inactive believers? Verses 47 and 48. As for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge him, but for I did not come to judge the world, but to say that there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. Note how verse 47 kind of shades into verse 48 there with that focus on hearing but not keeping. I mean, it's, it's like the parable of the sower. It's like James 1.22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. They will listen and perhaps they'll compliment us on our fine expositional sermons. But they won't do their actions won't be changed. You realize in John's gospel, we have a whole category with the same word, believe, for people who believe but aren't saved. It's this kind of inactive faith. One person has said believers are the ones who are still there when everyone else has left. J.C. Ryle described this kind of disguised unbelief. Ryle in Holiness writes, there are many who appear to know far more than they live up to and see far more than they practice and yet continue in the state for many years. 
They believe in heaven, yet seem faintly to long for it, and in hell, and yet seem little to fear it. They love the Lord Jesus, but the work they do for Him is small. They hate the devil, but they often appear to tempt Him to come to them. They know the time is short, but they live as if it were long. They know the time is short, but they live as if it were long. We must beware a belief which will think but won't speak up. We must beware a belief which will listen attentively but won't do. This kind of partial belief is no true saving belief at all. Real believers speak up and live on the words they say they believe. Friends, so much more we could say about this in this context, dealing with with preachers, you know the word. This seems like a, a repeat of Moses, doesn't it? These great works done, and yet they do not believe. Or Isaiah, even a great action of the deliverance of Jerusalem, and still the people do not believe. The message comes, and the people, with every reason in the world to accept it, reject it. But there's a remnant that believe. Is that not the story of the Bible again and again? God does great things. We reject a remnant believe. This is what happens, it seems, when the Word of God comes. Now, the point of all this is not to remove your responsibility to believe or to make you think that your bad sermons don't matter. It is really simply to appeal to you to believe and to encourage you to directly appeal to the people who hear you preach to believe. Don't merely describe the gospel. Call them to believe the gospel. Use imperative verbs. Call them to repent and believe. Some people won't, but some people will. And you can't tell if you're doing it truly or rightly by how many don't and how many do. John says in John 20, verse 30, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Friends, these are written that you may believe. The Word was made flesh, and the Word has been inscripturated so that you and I can preach the Word so that people may believe. Let's pray together. Lord God, we are destroyed and remade by Your Word. Idols are smashed, and hopes spring up where we had only had despair. Lord, for those of us who have wrongly idolized immediate, obvious, apparent fruit, deliver us, we pray. Lord, for those of us who have been discouraged, because of seeming fruitlessness in ministry. Oh God, will you both bring people to believe through the preaching of your word and encourage our hearts. Teach us to be faithful even in the hardest of days. Use us. Use all of us. Use us all up, we pray, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.